Welcome, everyone. We are live. The James Loud Show, and that is your host, James Loud. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to week five of the James Loud Show. This week, we have Energene. Energene is a company uh, based out of Israel that works in the world with genomics, plant genomics, uh, animal genomics, uh, and Ori here. Um, from Eugene, do you want to tell us a little bit about your company? Sure. Um, so um, we're not doing that much animals or humans anymore. Uh, we did a few very interesting projects uh, back in the day in, with human, but most of what we do is around plant genomics. Um, I would say about a third of what we do in the last three years revolves around cannabis and hemp but the other two thirds are regular crops, maize, wheat, and potatoes, and canola, and what the stuff people eat. This is what got me into the whole, um, well, I started working with Canadian companies and around Canadian crops. So sooner or later, we realized that Canadian crops means cannabis <laughs> at some point. Uh, so that, that's how I got into the field of cannabis genomics. Fantastic. So, uh, as far as with energy, and how has COVID affected you guys? I know it feels okay, but you know, the well, it's, it's it it affected the world the world dramatically uh, of how people do business. So, the work itself we could do anywhere from home. Computational work is computational work. And most of our, our providers, after about a gap around February or March, where people kind of didn't know how to deal with it, learned how to deal with it and reopen. And we can now ship DNA from clients to providers, perform the sequencing on time, and the analysis is data. So that isn't affected. Sales and human interactions have been uh, affected kind of in, in a uh, difficult way. It's very difficult to to actually close deals or, or advance new deals uh, without meeting people in person. Just And, and I think that's, I, I miss it. Uh, um, ongoing projects and most of what we do, we're talking about anything from, I think the shortest duration of, of what we do is three months. Most of what we do is two and a half years kind of projects. So these have been ongoing and people um, kind of set aside their funds for this and have kind of anticipated they, they have, you know, budgets already uh, allotted for, for working with us. So that hadn't been influenced, but new, new business coming in is different. And that's totally COVID. So do you want to explain a little bit about what you guys did, you know, a little history and maybe a little bit about the process of what you guys do with crops? Okay. Um, so we've been around since 2010. I just graduated from my PhD in Jerusalem and I joined a company. I worked on rice breeding. I was, I had rice plots in Israel and in India. I had several projects in I grew rice, <laughs> uh, I, I was a breeder for rice and we started developing genomic tools. There was not much, definitely not commercial, mostly academic, but there was not much outside of the you know, the Monsantos and pioneers out there. Um, they were the only ones doing advanced breeding outside of academia and even these big companies like to outsource pure research into academic institutions. So we got into that. Uh, we had several projects in maize and in, in rice and chili pepper, which is an interesting analogy to cannabis. I'll, I'll maybe touch that later. And uh, we grew, we did all this project uh, technically, you know, technical season in Israel, actual field work and molecular work in India. Um, we did, that was 2010. The final output was uh, genetic markers. We delivered to the client very good genetic markers 
sequences that can let you track disease resistance or diseases prevalent in, in India, and also for other traits that affect the quality and the price of the product. For rice in India, it's the length of the grain, for example, that really affects the price. Basmati rice with the long grain, way more expensive than your regular um, short grain rice. Um, so this is how we, we started. Uh, we were very successful at that project. And then uh, we realized that there, the world is not exactly ready for genetic markers. So we had to reinvent ourselves to um, get something more widespread and more applicable to other crops. So we got into doing genomics for others as a service. And we started, we started assembling genomes. We have uh, developed a kind of a software slash hardware protocol and algorithms that did a much better job than everybody else uh, back in the day. Um, this is around 2000. 14, 15 already, uh, and I think the height of that was the bread wheat genome that was on the cover of Science Magazine. It was a challenge that people worked on for decades, and within less than a year, we brought a uh, wheat genome that was like no one has ever seen before in terms of quality. So we realized we're, we're good at genome assemblies, and we started assembling genomes like crazy. Um, and we did about 450 genomes of pretty much anything from mango trees to hummingbirds. Uh, you, you'd expect people to not breed hummingbirds, but uh, we've had paying clients for hummingbirds. Um, so that market kind of faded away because now people can do a pretty good job on their own unless the genomes are complicated. So we specialized in the more complicated stuff. And then we started really taking the basic genome assemblies into using it for agriculture, for breeding. Uh, and that opened an entirely different market for us. So we have several alleys of, of actually um, kind of building high quality genomes and then comparing them and employing them and, and making tools for breeders to make the breeding process way more efficient. Uh, in some cases, you're, you're talking about reducing the breeding time from seven, eight, nine years to two or three. Wow. And, and then there's the tough cookies. Cannabis is not, a, not an easy genome. It's not very big, but it's very complex. And they're all heterozygous. I'll touch that later. Um, they're, the analytics of the cannabis genomes are, for example, way more difficult than a maize genome. So there's, there's uh, plenty of work for us to, to handle the uh, more complicated crops, and we like it that way. Nice. Excellent. So I guess let's take a couple steps back and talk, you know, so, some uh, basic stuff like what is uh, DNA and RNA? I think That'd be, that'd be valuable for everybody. And, uh, you know, as far as what is a gene and, and how do you guys go through that? Okay, so I made a couple of slides that, um, that have this. It's not something I could talk about without uh, graphic, graphic, uh, right, why is not, okay. Do you guys see my screen? Yes. Excellent. All right. Yeah, a couple of words I should probably say that uh, about our company that we are based out of Israel. We work with, uh, we, we have a large team now also in North America, mostly Canada and, and well, some, some in the US, some in Canada. Um, but we're not a cannabis company. We don't breed for ourselves. We work for others. We do the anal analytics for others. So we're kind of a hired gun and um, we get, asked about this a lot so i have the slide kind of ready like do you, do you use my dna do you take my dna so no we take clients data and dna we analyze it we deliver it and then it's deleted off our servers we don't use it uh very important for me to emphasize that point uh okay so i made a couple of slides about the basic architecture of plants i know not everybody in the audience is a um, plant breeder or a plant um, 
you know, botanist or uh, formal education in, in, in that. Some people could probably teach me a lot about cannabis that I don't know. Um, but the basic structure of most plants, especially the plants that we eat or consume, um, revolves around tissue types. So there's a huge difference in the macro and the micro level that the uh, tissue looks. And, and these are kind of illustrations of, of if you cut the plant in many places, you'll see different structures of the tissue. And this is important for what we're gonna do later. And obviously the flower has a, a totally different uh, structure than the uh, root or the stem or the leaves. Uh, there are common features, but the basic unit of all living plants is uh, the cell. So um, I won't go into um, the terminology around cannabis flowers, I just want to go directly into cells. You asked about DNA and genes. So um, the basic unit of all tissues are cells. Within the cell is the nucleus, lots of other organellas, but we're not touching that today. Inside the nucleus, there's the chromosome, which really compacts and stores all the genetic information to make another one of these cells or tissue or another plant. And some specialized cells have the information or have the information to uh, merge with another type and create a new combination and progeny, the germline. And the chromosomes contain the genetic information. So cannabis would have um, 10 chromosomes or nine chromosomes and one sex chromosomes, double of each. It's a diploid plant. So the chromosome is a really super dense, super compacted string of DNA. The genetic material is really DNA. And that is super compacted on three levels of twirling and curling around histones, kind of twisted and twisted. Twirling. I think there's in each cell about a few yards of DNA if you pull them uh, at once as one string. But basically, the genome, the entire genome, is one string of these uh, this molecule. It's one straight line of molecules consisting of four basic units. These are the bases or base pairs, and this is the genetic code. So each three uh, code for something. And then there are other features of, of the arrangement of the genome that may not code, but actually regulate. So the basic concept is that there's genetic string, one giant string of information. Only a small portion of it actually codes. Uh, most of it is either used for regulatory purposes or spacing, but mostly regulatory elements. And then once you have the DNA sequence, some of it, very small part of it, uh, not necessarily one straight line, sometimes it's truncated, it gives another way to regulate it. And some of the codes, uh, some of the sequence there is what's called a coding sequence. And some of the coding sequence is what's called a gene. So a gene is, is your basic coding unit that can um, move around from generation to generation and usually has um, a function either to build some sort of backbone in the plant or in the living organism or actually to regulate. Uh, so once you have DNA and within the DNA coding sequences or genes, um, there is an activity, complex activity called transcription meaning you take the genes and you need messengers to actually carry them out. So those are RNA and they are regulatory um, features. They do a lot of other things, but mostly what they do is transfer the signal from the code, from the blueprint to the actual uh, construction site with the, I don't know, construction site analogy. Um, so once the RNA is um, created, and there are many ways to code, to regulate, to stop, to enhance, and to change the uh, performance of, of this process. Uh, this is why one set of, of coding sequence with not that many genes can create an entire creature. 
And plants have a magnificent feature of actually generating an entire plant from um, any type of cell. You could move for almost any type of cell. You could grow plants in tissue culture, and you could actually do cloning. If you take a human finger that happened to be severed away, you can't put it in a medium and it will grow the entire human again. This is because the process goes through a lot of steps of regulation. And uh, once you pass certain gates or certain uh, gatekeepers, you can't go back. Plants have the uh, stem cell or totipotency, it's called, the ability to go back to kind of a primary state and then become whatever is needed. So you could take a cutting and the entire industry of cannabis or uh, recreational cannabis, medicinal cannabis is based on the fact that you could take a cutting, put it in some medium, and then the bottom part with the right signals would grow roots and the top part would grow leaves. This is unique to plants. So going back to messenger, uh, this is an RNA. And then um, there's a process called translation. The, uh, some of the RNA actually have a purpose. They code for proteins. And translation is the process of taking the information on the RNA and building amino acids and protein um, on top of that to create proteins. And that's called the workforce. These make up the actual cell and enzymes that make processes. So in some, some cases, the processes are, are essential for maintenance of, of the cell. In some cases, these proteins are enzymes that make interesting compounds. Uh, I guess a lot of the people in the crowd are interested in how enzymes make terpenes and cannabinoids. So that's one particular focus group of, of proteins that are called enzymes and have a specific task for multiple tasks. Um, that's kind of, uh, you know, this, this is kind of the overview of what is DNA. And um, I have another slide that has kind of terminology that we need to bring everybody to uh, kind of the same page on, on terminology. Inbred lines and uh, homozygous or heterozygous lines. So this is an example from maize. Um, inbred lines would have two copies of each chromosomes, the one I showed here. So each crop copy in an inbred line would have the exact identical copy, uh, identical two copies of the same chromosomes. Um, so this is called homozygous or inbred, completely inbred. And if you take two lines, two lines like this, parental lines, you, you cross those. They're depicted here in green and gray. And if you cross them, you create an F1 hybrid, a true F1 hybrid, fully heterozygous. Um, and this is what the seed industry lives. This is the bread and butter of food industry. These F1 seeds will make an F1 plant. They're all identical. Um, they're all, um, you know, they, they're uniform. They're always the same. And they, they, they contain the same genetics from half from the, the, the female and half from the male parent. And it uses a phenomena called heterosis or hybrid figure in which the progeny performs better on many parameters than the two parents. In this case, this is a classic picture from maize. Uh, it grows on the same time. It grows much faster, much bigger, both on the plant and on the, uh, well, it's analogous of, of the inflorescence of the actual product that we're, we're interested in. Um, cannabis is tricky. Cannabis does not let us do that. Cannabis um, does not like to be inbred. Cannabis has a tendency because of its dioecious nature. It has male and female flowers. So it prefers not to be inbred. In many cases, um, if you inbreed cannabis for multiple generations, either by selfing or by uh, mechanical, chemical, synthetic tricks, um, you will have very weak flowers, they, they, or very weak plants, they grow slowly. They are sometimes, uh, they lack vigor, they, sometimes the pollen is sterile, sometimes the seed don't germinate, or you have very little seeds. So creating an F1 hybrid, a true F1 hybrid, 
uh, like they do in in the maize industry that's the holy grail of the industry but it's not easy to do with this plant so cannabis came up with two solutions um, just real quick i got a question for you so yeah. with uh f1 hybrids we i was always told that when you when you make an f1 hybrid you have 50 percent in the middle that uh, represents the, the both of the parents you have 25 percent leaning towards one parent and then 25 percent leaning towards the other parent um is that is that the same with all crops? I thought that was Mendelian. Mm, okay, no. So a true F1 uh, hybrid, like in maize, is a hundred percent half mom, half dad. Um, okay. They're all identical. You buy the seeds like this, you plant them in the field, and they're all like clone. They're all like uniform in the field. That's a true F1 seed. You cannot buy this in cannabis yet. Um, what the cannabis industry has done is two things. Clones. You take a cutting, and we, we kind of touched that before. The genetic makeup is heterozygous. Each chromosome or each, you know, there's chromosome nine or four or five, but the content of each chromosome may be different. Maybe not, but maybe different. We don't care. We just take a cut, and we root it, and we clone it, and we have more of the same. The nice thing about it, this if you like this plant and its performance, then you have mo more of it and they're identical. The caveat of this is once you get disease or something happens to the mother stock, you're in trouble. Um, they're all as susceptible to the disease. And um, if you lose your mother stocks, you cannot reconstruct from seed the exact same flower. That's kind of the um you know the caveat of working from clones and the logistics the logistics are complicated cuttings rooting making sure there's no contamination um there's something called clonal drift as well uh sure. viruses if you have a virus in here they tag along with the clones um lots of things around logistics and around and vigor if you start from seed, the plants may grow much bigger and stronger and faster than if you start from clones and root them and 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 and, and do things in kind of an artificial way. So people have gotten used to this method and, and, and know how to operate this, and this is what the industry lives on, and, and this is what um, – if you're not good at this, you're in the wrong business. But uh, this is a solution that the industry came up with because it cannot make true F1 seeds. Hemp, on the other hand, did something slightly different. And this kind of goes to what you just mentioned. Hemp is doing something called semi-stable or semi-segregating seeds, meaning you have two parents that are, some of them are identical or somewhat stable. And, and this here's the example is the blue boxes. So this region in the genome of one parent is identical, so it's fixed or stable that trait will be passed on to the progeny, all progeny. And imagine if this is a dominant trait and you only, win, you only need one blue box, all the progeny will have for sure that blue box. And if that blue box contains several genes, then these genes do something and it's important to you. For example, powder milder resistance or synthesis of THC, then all your lines will have the trait of interest. So the plants may not be fully identical. If you look at hemp fields, they're not exactly identical in most cases, unless grown from clones. But they're stable for what's important. The flowering time, the height, the, I don't know, THC content, whatever has been stabilized or reached homozygosity um, is... It, is going to stay stable and uniform, and you could work that way with seeds. And it, it makes sense financially to work with seeds, although some hemp growers do work with uh, uh, actually with clones and, and plant them. Um, and then there's also the male and female issue, which also is kind of complicated in this crop. I, I won't touch that at this uh, point. So I think, uh, you know, this is, uh, I'll stop sharing this presentation now and unless I need to revert back to it. Um, yes, how, how do you guys identify genes? Sorry? 
how do you guys identify teams as far as tools? Uh, oh, <laughs> so I'm going to need the presentation again. Oh. <laughs> Should have told me. <laughs> uh, I'm going to need that again. Uh, we have, well, we don't identify genes directly because that is not easy to do. Um, we, uh, sorry. Uh, for some reason it won't let me, okay, it does. Right, I'm back on that. I'll go to presentation mode. And I have a slide that actually shows how we do it. Um, so first of all, we need to select good founders based on genetic distances. This is one thing we do. That's kind of the basics. First of all, we take inventory and we look at what the client has. We analyze it. We look at genetic distances. If you have two nice clones that you work with and there's not much to analyze. This step is not necessary because you only have two, three, ten clones. But if you have hundreds of them, and, and, and most people do have a collection, then you need to analyze genetic distances and select founders one, two, and three based on genetic distances and also traits of interest. Once you did that process and you selected uh, extremes, for example, short flowering time with long flowering time, you can make a cross, create a population, and we like to analyze 200 plants. You grow them once, 200 individuals, they need to segregate. Because they're a four-way hybrid, each parent is actually uh, one of those, like this, heterozygous. Uh, the, the genetic content of each plant, of each parent is different. So we will cross, for example, one and two and create a population. Actually, the client does that. We're not, actually, we're not touching the actual plants. We get data and DNA as inputs. Um, and we analyze the segregation pattern in the population. This is called a mapping population. And we do what's called a QTL mapping. So imagine you crossed a short duration plant with a long duration plant, blue and green. They segregate the 200 individuals, or 192. They segregate, and in each area of the genome, there's a combination of the potential um, genetic makeup of the parents. They're called haplotypes, actually. And we can map each one of these blocks and associate them with the phenotypes, um, meaning, in this case, flowering time. So what we need as input is DNA from the two parents, DNA from the population, and then um, data on, on the actual performance of one cycle of those 200 individuals. And we will do this mapping, and we will associate a region in chromosomes, in a certain chromosome, with the trait. So once we did that, for example, in order to have whatever phenotype this, long duration flowering, you need to have the dark green version. So we now have a region that we defined that has a dark green version. Now, you asked, how do we find a gene? So now we could zoom into, because we analyzed the genome, we could zoom into that region. First thing we could do is generate genetic markers. If you want to transfer or to make sure that you have the dark green version, look at this sequence. This is all you need to do. You don't need to, you don't care what it does. You don't care. Um, all you need to do is to distinguish who has this sequence. What it does, that's a separate question. Now, once you define a region, you could zoom in at higher resolution and then find your candidate genes. So this region might contain more than one region. It could contain 10, it could contain 5, it could contain 100. So uh, you need to zoom in and then employ other tools. This is a more complicated task. Um, it could be done. And there are other more complicated ways and more expensive ways to look at multiple. Uh, once you have a region of interest, you could compare multiple genomes or multiple types of cannabis and on the same region, see what they have. It kind of 
may give you a clue on to what are the candidate genes. So once you have candidate genes, you need to, to do several things. You could clone them and express them in other organisms. You could do a test cross and make sure that if the gene passed and the, the phenotype also passed, things like that to verify that your candidate gene is actually what you've been looking for. Um, we could do that for anything that segregates. Um, if the trait is measurable and it segregates in the population, any trait of interest uh, is something we could look at. For example, people ask for powdery mildew resistance. If you have two lines that one is resistant, one is susceptible, we analyze the parents, we analyze the client makes the cross, we analyze the um, segregated population, and we find regions of interest that may have the genes, and we definitely make the markers regardless of knowledge of the genes to track the disease resistance region. Those are called QTLs, uh, quantitative trait loci, meaning it's a region in the genome responsible for the trait, uh, either quantitatively or single gene, but you don't know that yet. You only need to do successful breeding. You only need to be able to track that region, and that is done by the genetic markers. So I don't have information yet, yet on which genes actually do this. I just have a practical way to follow them around and, and move them from plant to plant. So any trait that segregates, like bud structure, like agricultural performance traits, flowering time, branching, uh, if it's measurable and segregates, we can map it. We can identify region that's associated and, and, and make sure you have the good version or the positive allele. Nice. Then there's, uh, yeah, just I'll, I'll finish this. Uh, people are always after yield increase. So yield is not exactly one trait. Yield is a mixture of multiple traits. So you need to break it down to... Uh, bud structure times, I don't know, leaf density, things like that. Uh, each trait is mapped on it separately, and the combination uh, leads to yield increase. Same goes for cannabinoid profile and unique terpene profile. So, so I actually have a question about that, because you guys work typically with genotypes, right? As far as we can talk a little bit about genotypes, phenotypes, and, and chemotypes. You know, because genotypes are, are one thing that's a constant. Phenotype and chemotype are impacted by uh, environment and nutrition. So how, how does that work with you guys? Okay. Um, we need to see – this is a good example that I have here. It's awesome. We, yeah, this is a, something called blood phenotype or blood drive. It's pretty rare. It comes from Hawaii. Um, this is a segregating F1 population, like the population I showed here or here. This is the actual pictures of the blood, blood uh, phenotype. So the sap on the flowers is blood red. Now, this is interesting because, I mean, it's cool. It gets pretty high sales. People like to use it in Halloween uh, pretty close. But the main interesting feature about this is that people who actually consume the flower of the ones that are red uh, report numbing of the face and the uh, arms and legs, peripheral nerves. So super important for medicinal cannabis and research on to uh, trait, having something that affects the facial nerves only, or not only, but mostly, is something really sought after by the pharma industry. Um, so we have a project with uh, an academic research and a client who owns this to, uh, and, and he took these pictures and let me, let me show them. Um, so we're doing this type of, of trait mapping project on this population. And the phenotype has to show, the phenotype is the actual trait that you're measuring. If you can't measure it and, and, and there's no phenotype or it's dependent on something, then I can't do the mapping. Uh, in this case, uh, this trait shows up when the temperature starts to rise. I mean, if I chopped up a bunch of branches, I don't know, like two months into the grow, 
I wouldn't see anything. They all look like this. The red color starts um, starts uh, developing only when the temperatures rise. Uh, this is like a greenhouse grow. And so this is the classic interaction between genotype and environment. The genes exist in, in these, the red ones, they all contain the machinery to make the red sap. They didn't show it until it got warm. So this is an interaction in, um, so I don't care what triggers the gene or what triggers, but I need to be able, or the client needs to be able to measure it. So if this was a terpene, and if the temperature is cold and your variety that's supposed to smell like bananas doesn't smell like bananas and you want to map the genes or the regions that are responsible for the banana smell and it, it, and it doesn't happen, then I can't map it. Or if it happens not uniformly in the, in the greenhouse where you have a colder place and the plants there don't express the banana smell. Or if you can't measure it because it's kind of a, a sensory feeling, right? There's no, you don't have an HPLC to measure the banana. So um, you need to be able to measure the phenotype. Sometimes it's super easy. Flowering time, you send somebody to the greenhouse, you record the flowering times. Um, easy. Sometimes you need expensive uh, chemical testing, and this goes to chemotype. Um, chemotype, if, if I had to define it, is the difference between the chemical profile of the tissue you're exploring, mostly flowers. And sometimes you can smell it or taste it or um, measure it in, in TLC or something fairly simple. Sometimes you need expensive analytics to actually detect it. Um, I have some examples of that. If we can, if you have time for that, I might show them later, but um, I need good, measurements that uh, could be trusted and reproducible. If somebody tells me this smells a bit like strawberry, but I can't really put a quantification on the strawberry smell. I don't know what I'm looking for. I can't map the trait. Um, yeah, this is, this is the next step, right? So in this case, what we did with the red stuff, um, we did dot plots and we quantified the red dots uh, by, um, um, computerized vision. We took pictures of the red dots, put RGB scale, red, blue, and green, and measured how much red, how much blue, how much green, and gave a numerical score to this because it's not easy to measure. So once you have an Excel file with data, these are actually the parents, then you could start asking questions on, on mapping. And then once you collect the sap, you need an expert. And this is why we work with uh, a professor in Israel. Oh, there's some feedback noise. Uh, so once we have uh, enough sap, we can send it for analytics. And maybe this is a flavonoid and you can employ HPLC methods and actually detect the compound. And then we could look at the region that we found and zoom in and try to find what makes it. So it's kind of a process. There's an, a, there's a very hardcore academic-like or high input research, but there's also practical stuff. If we make genetic markers, those are easy to do. Anybody can send to a genotyping lab and get an answer back, like keep plants 13, 54, and 16. And wow. you don't need much. You don't need the fancy analytics if you're not doing that kind of research. So, and how big is the progeny you guys would work with on a project, like uh, your typical projects? Um, okay, so this type of analysis, we analyze 200 individuals. So one of the key features of the way we work is that you don't need much space. The first cycle is the only one where you fully grow the plants. So you do need to grow, fully grow, 200 individuals, and if you need to make copies of them, then you also need to clone them and, and, and keep duplicates. But we only need the DNA of 200 individuals and the phenotype data for that population. And once we come up with the genetic markers, we do the analysis and come up with the gen genetic markers, then you can screen thousands of plants. You don't fully grow them. You use very little space. You grow them in trays. 
screen the little seedlings and whatever doesn't uh, have the right kind of genotype that you're after, you discard it and you keep only the plants you need and almost zero space. I mean, it's a bit, uh, you know, there's still labor involved. You need to send samples, you need to take leaves and, and send them to, to be genotyped, but it's much easier and much cheaper uh, to do. Uh, okay, that's, so that's, let me just get a glass of water. <clears throat> So we, we got the, the tons of questions, but, I, but I've been holding them. So uh, everybody who's watching, just kind of keep them uh, on standby because at some point we will get to your questions. But I, I love just let, let's go deep and dork out. I want to, James, I'm sure you, you, got, you got an expert in front of you. Pepper him with the questions you want to ask. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. So, so Ori, how do viruses affect the genomics sequence data? Oh wow, the, the, that's that's an ex excellent question. So viruses are well, plant viruses. Um, I won't relate to COVID. I hate it. <laughs> ruined ruined my life. Um, so viruses <laughs> in the plant world um, have there's several kinds. There's vir viruses and something called viroids, which are virus like. They don't all behave in the same manner. There's some viruses that actually integrate into the genome and some viruses that are just present in the um, cell. And then there's some viruses that uh, uh, are RNA viruses and replicate and that's what they do. And then there's some viruses that are DNA and in some cases they can integrate and affect the genome, not necessarily in a bad way. Um, not easy to detect. Um, you first have to isolate a virus and know its sequence, and then somebody has to develop an assay um, to detect the virus. Once you've isolated it and, and have the genetic sequence, it's easy to develop an assay, and the assay would be very cheap. And you could screen, it would be something like this, a genetic sequence that is unique to the virus, very sensitive. You screen the leaves of, of your samples, and if it's present, you, you know you have a contamination and you should probably do something about it. If you're working with clones and you found the contamination in your mother stock, um, you're in trouble. In some cases, you could go through tissue cultures, and there are actually several good labs that provide this kind of indexing service, and um, they run the plant through tissue culture and have it um, reconstructed afterwards. Usually, the virus, I mean, you make sure that the plants you reconstructed haven't got the virus. Um, one of the risks of this is that you lose the clone that the reconstructed plant after tissue culture comes out uh, not identical to the original clone. With like somaclonal variation? Uh, somaclonal or other types of, of things. Uh, we kind of briefly touched that when we talked, uh, I think last week, sometimes that Soma clonal variation is not there. You, you do the full genome sequence on the clone and on the original plant, they're identical. Yet some, yet they don't do, they don't have the same phenotype. They don't perform the same. Why? Because the tissue culture stage shut down entire pathways. Tissue culture tends to do that. This relates to epigenetics and gene regulation. Sometimes, for example, with flavonoids, Good example because I have it in, right in front of me. You tobacco, you you take the tobacco plant, you grow it, and you it makes flavonoids, characteristics of tobacco, and then you pass it through tissue culture. You may end up with a clone that does not produce flavonoids or produce only half the pathway of flavonoids. It shut the the whole pathway down. Why? We're not exactly sure. Nobody's really exactly sure, uh, but it, it's just so. Should so genetically, nothing changed. 
but the gene expression pathway pattern changes. So um, you, you will not be able to produce in that plant that same amount of flavonoids in some, maybe in some cases you won't be able to produce flavonoids at all. And the plant would in theory be genetically identical. So something in the regulatory mechanisms beyond DNA changes and, um, and shuts down pathways. But this is why you work in replicates, in, in multiple duplicates. When you send something to be clean in tissue culture, and cannabis is not the only, not the only industry that uses tissue culture. Um, it's a good way to cryoprotect and preserve your clone, by the way. And if you go through cleaning and then you reconstruct and have multiple plants that are clones that have been cleaned up, and then one of them performs just as good as the original, then you, you're successful and, and you, you cleaned it up, you prior preserve it, and you also uh, keep cloning as you used to. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it's, um, it's a bit of a risk, but usually it's successful. And if you have the virus, like uh, the hops latent virus that's been plaguing the country for, for the last time, or at least the Western coast, mm -hmm. and there are some other viruses, uh, there's some, there was some, I forget the name of it, that was identified in, uh, by an Israeli researcher, so I, I read about it. Uh, not very common in the US, uh, but I think in Canada they actually uh, are starting to suffer from that. They grow indoor a lot. They're very uh, susceptible to uh, transfer of viruses um, because they work with clones and, and it's indoor. And, and if there's something, an, an insect or a vector that carries the virus, somehow manages to go into the grow rooms or propagation rooms, uh, it, it could be like wildfire. And you know that it's it's there and it causes damages it damage sometimes the virus is there it's latent it doesn't do much if the plant is well it's in the genome it hops in this is how evolution happens one of the mechanisms that evolution happens viruses hop and integrate into regions in the genome and sometimes they shut down genes or create um, overexpression of certain genes and you have an interesting phenotype uh, there's some cases in other crops where virus lands into a gene or the genome before a gene and it has a regulatory element that's very strong and it creates huge expression of that gene. And if that gene meant something to you because you're a human being and you, you consume the plant, then you, you're, you have a mutant, you have a new variety that is actually superior. Um, so it's not necessarily a bad thing. Hops latent virus is terrible. <laughs> yeah. So with HPLV, if, if we found a variety that was resistant to it or it, it carried it but it didn't express, that's something that you could help identify and we could, we could breed if they're resistant to that, resistant to uh, cultivars. Uh, we would have to devise, uh, and, and this is part of what we do. I sit with the clients. I, I understand what they have in terms of germplasm. I understand what the need is. I understand what the capability and budget and, you know, uh, patience, because some people want results fast within six months, and and they, they're not aware of, of the length that this takes so sometimes they, they they got all the above but they don't have, they they won't go into a project that lasts nine months or, or so so i need to understand you know where where people have a need that uh they have all the parameters to go into a project like this but technically if there's the right conditions and, and we figure out we can devise some sort of a a program involving multiple tools, not necessarily in-house. You could outsource stuff and, you know, plan a project to map um, resistance genes or QTLs or actually find, you know, identify a virus, things like that. Some things are not our expertise. Um, transcript data, things like that, we, we could use. We integrate that into the genome. but. This is not exactly what we, uh, we are the experts. There are other people who, who have a 
do transcriptomics and, and um, protein annotation and, and things like that, they're greater experts than we are. But genomics and comparative genomics, that's, you've come to the right place. Uh, yeah. Awesome. So we got a question from one of my friends here. Genetically different is hemp from what we consider hemp from THC cannabis, like industrial hemp versus cannabis sativa. In the U.S., hemp is anything below 0.3% THC. So it's basically cannabis. You know, cannabis is a sativa L. Are you looking at a, a industrial hemp? So yes, we have looked at uh, we've uh, we've done over seventy something the novo assembly of cannabis genomes. Uh, I think over closer to a hundred actually now. Um, some of them are hemp. Some of them are hybrid type. Some of them are drug type of one way or, or the other. Some of them are fiber type, and I, you know, this is kind of too heavy for for most of the crowd but we you look at some versions of the same enzyme like i look at a at an enzyme that i know what it does and i compare 20 genomes and one of them happens to be fiber type and it brings with it the the fiber type parent brings the unique version of this gene so the overall genome may be somewhat different but um there are, there could be particular genes or the presence or lack of uh, these genes that makes a difference. Um, in, in that particular example that I looked at, only the, the fiber type has, now I don't even know what it do. We're not doing biochemistry. This is not, we, we do the genomics. I could just tell that this variety or cultivar uh, has a unique allele or unique version of the gene that comes from fiber hemp. Because I know the parent and, and I have the lineage information on that uh, on that particular cultivar, so it's very different. Otherwise, as you can see, this is a work done in 2016. Uh, several people have repeated this in, in 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 many other ways. You look at multiple regions in the genome and you start to do something called a phylogenetic tree uh, uh, comparison of the genetic diversity. There's actual parameters to compare that. And you could make, you could divide the, spe divide the species of cannabis into subgroups. Um, the hemp and cannabis differentiation is completely arbitrary by, by man-made legal system. Both plants are crossable, they're identical by, um, you know, what they look like. So you, if you analyze, hundreds or, or tens of, of lines, they will clade up into groups and you would be able to find types of, of plants that are um, phenotypically hemp, meaning they will not make THC, taller plants, uh, all the features of, of hemp. And also hemp is quite different. If you're looking at classic hemp that was used for rope and fiber, hemp that was used for oil and seed, and hemp that is used for CBD. Now the CBD type may look closer to um, other types of cannabis, but the differentiation between hemp and cannabis is completely man-made. As you can see, there's a type of hemp that, that is here within the narrow leaf drug type. So it's more similar to narrow leaf drug type than to other hemp types, right? So. This is probably not, you know, this is probably a hemp type that is mostly used for resin, for CBD extraction, and it would be hot. It would pro probably also produce THC. Um, there is some correlation between the genetic makeup to what people see, you know, the sativa, indica kind of features, narrow leaf, broad leaf, and, and so on. But over the last few decades, people have mixed and crossed everything with everything. Oh, right. so, uh, yeah, so that distinction between sativa and indica and ruderalis and, uh, you know, narrow leaf, broad, narrow leaf and broad leaf is just a trait now. In, in some cases, it has correlation with what the chemotype would be like. 
In other cases, you could have narrow leaf that kind of is behaving like hemp, and then the other way around, uh, they're not necessarily correlated. Uh, yeah, but, I think there's a big confusion, especially in the in the the recreational markets in the United States. Just in general, people think sativa, indica, ruderalis. You know, even the growers think ruderalis, but uh, you know, and then and then hybrids. But it's like pretty much everything is a hybrid, and there's lots of narrow leaf and and wide leaf drug varietals that that have the effect of the other and i think there's a you know it, it, you look at the genetics on that and you'll see a lot of similarities to but uh not all wide leaf has, has sedative effects and not all narrow leaf has you know euphoric like a really strong caffeine like effect yeah absolutely there's no um there are specific genes and enzymes that are responsible for the compounds made in a trichome. And they, uh, they make the chemotype of the plant. So it could look like a hemp plant on the morphology, but if the genes that the plant has and that are expressed in the trichomes, uh, you know, if you have a certain terpene synthase and it's expressed in the trichome, you would have a terpene not characteristic of hemp. And if that terpene has a, you know, a sedative effect, I think it's myrcene that has the sedative effect and you consume the extract of that flower, anyway you, you, you do that, it will kind of make you sleepy and drowsy and, and kind of relax. So um, it may look from the outside like, like uh, something like one kind and, and then chemically the chemotype would be completely different. Yeah. And in some cases you could genetically determine that before. In most cases, it's just too complex to have an essay beforehand and say and predict, oh, this plant would be this uh, sedative or uh, we're not there yet in, in cannabis because the amount of terpenes and the enzymes that make them is very, very large and very, very diverse. So we can't just look at the genetics of the plant now and predict, oh, this one would be sedative or would make a lot of beta caryophylline or would make osimine. Right. We cannot do that yet. Um, and well, also the terpenes are environmentally affected. Right. Uh, so that's, that makes it even more difficult to predict. Yeah, and, and part of the, the challenge, I think, is also the human, human body, the interaction is so unique to the individual that one person may get a suppression and the other person may have a appetite suppression or a different effect from it. So we're still in the process of figuring all this stuff out. Um, there are quite a few researchers on the academic side and companies that offer some sort of testing um, to kind of evaluate the, the genetics of the individual, the human, and they say, okay, if you have this kind of metabolism, that kind of metabolism, then you will respond to this type of cannabis and that type of cannabis in certain ways. Um, it's, it's a beginning. Once they collect a lot of data, it will mean something. Currently, uh, most of them are at the stage of actually collecting that data. We're talking big data, as big data could get, a lot of information with a lot of subjective, unmeasurable stuff. You know, it makes you dizzy, it makes you drowsy. How drowsy, how dizzy? Can you measure that? You can't, so the data is, is fuzzy. So it's not an easy task, but we're, you know, the more data we're collecting, and this is super important, the more chance we have of actually predicting stuff and, and trying to, you know, say, okay, if you need to have, you have sleep disorders, you need varieties with a lot of myrcene. So we don't exactly know how much myrcene and we don't exactly know what other things would be there, but we can say that this would have a lot of myrcene. It would be help you sleep better. Right. So we're, we're getting there. Slowly. Not. Yeah, not specifically energy. I mean, science in general, research. Yeah. So, what are some of the new, th you know, the things you guys discovered that you can share with us as far as markers? Uh, uh, okay. So, I, as I mentioned, we are a hired gun. 
we work for others on, on the research side, so we can't share the information that we find for others. I did um, I did show a couple of, I'll show you something interesting. We have compared uh, about 50 genomes of um, cannabis and hemp, and don't be intimidated by the, <laughs> this is hardcore science here. To those of you who are in this world, okay, and those of you who are not, this is kind of mind blowing. I'll, I'll explain and, and um, I'll kind of try to explain the meaning of things. So we've mentioned protein earlier, and the proteins are the actual machinery that makes the, the chemicals that make the aroma, smell, taste of, uh, and, and, and psychological effects or psychoactive effects of, of this plant. Um, so I, I'm talking about terpenes in this demonstration. You could look at the TPSs, terpene synthases. Uh, there are hundreds of them in cannabis. Some of them make one product, some of them make multiple products, some of them are dependent on certain factors to make um, one product or the other. Some information we know, some information is still in basic research. So this group of terpene synthases have been crystallized and this is one of the ways to study protein. Uh, so this is like a 3D model of the protein chains that make the enzymes very complex. A lot of people have worked on uh, this type of research, but they figure out that the protein sequence has uh, codes for certain regions that fold in a certain ways. And the ABCDs here are certain uh, niches or patches in the protein structure that let in um, certain molecules from one side. And in some cases, they fold them, they bend them, they detach or attach stuff to them and let them the other side different. Uh, so this is the basic structure of terpene synthase and some of the regions here were identified. The one here in the, I think this is called magenta, right? Purplish kind of color, uh, is the active site of this enzyme or one of the active sites. And the type of sequence that you have here is um, kind of fairly characterized. So there's been some studies that actually, uh, well, they did a lot of work, so I should give the credit to the people who did this. Uh, but um, they know that if they have certain amino acids here, they'll have one product. But if they make uh, other amino acids, they'll have a completely different product or the ratio of the products would change. So we've compared something like this, multiple uh, enzymes that look like terpene synthase 9 or terpene synthase in general. And you could look at a certain region. So we found an enzyme, for example, uh, circled here, which has a mutation. The amino acid M, methionine, uh, had been mutated into something else, valine. Uh, it's a very different amino acid. It would create a different structure here. And if you have met methionine, the enzyme prefers to make beta-caryophyllin that smells like black pepper. Or at least that's what people associate it with. Uh, by the way, it is somewhat psychoactive, uh, about two orders of magnitude less, less than THC, but you could get high on this terpene. Uh, I think it binds to CD1 receptor. Um, so um, if you have valine there, and we've actually found an enzyme that has this, um, it's more likely to make alpha humulin. Alpha humulin smells hopsy or, you know, kind of the, uh, I don't know how to define the smell, but hopsy is, is as good as it uh, gets. So we can actually tell by looking at the enzymes, uh, if we have a version that ha prefers this or that path, and if you have the two copies, you, you, you may end up making both black pepper smell and uh, hop smell. So this is the kind of things we could look at if there's prior information, so we do stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, this image is actually from uh, Keith Allen and the, and the guys from, um, uh, they're now Front Range Biosciences. Uh, they published this, so um, they did that part of, of, the, of the work, not related to us. We just looked at the, we just knew where to look. So if there's prior information and pe people publish stuff, we could look at interesting regions and then find interesting features. Uh, 
if we need to discover things from scratch, then it's, uh, it's a more difficult case. So powdery mildew kind of uh, plant earlier this year, I believe somebody made an announcement at the, uh, the big uh, thing in San Diego that they'd identified markers for powdery mildew. Have you guys identified, or if you can talk about it, identified? Uh, um, I cannot comment on that. Uh, I could comment on the publication uh, that was uh, released at PAG. Yeah. They found a set of genes and a region that's associated in one type of uh, one type of genome. They they also looked at other genomes, and, but there's variation. And then the pathogen that they looked they looked at powdery mildew is not one pathogen. Uh, powdery mildew is at least three types of fungi, either together or separately. Um, some argue it's two, some argue it's three, but at least two are there. So, and each one of these fungi are not exactly identical. So once you have resistance to powdery mildew, it's not necessarily what's called a broad range resistance. It's the fact that you have um, powdery mildew resistance, and, and that work actually is is, is very nice work, and, and um, I'm not belittling not belittling that work at all. I mean, I'm just saying it has its limitation. Um, it means that you could actually have a region to look at, for example, right now. But also, um, powdery mildew resistance needs to be tested on site. If you have a type of pathogen that bugs you in your facility and you have one variety that's resistant, you should find the resistance at your local site. The fact that somebody uh, 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 discovered uh, type of resistance doesn't mean that you could use that resistance on your pathogens. Maybe yes, but not necessarily. Um, you, you'd have to test this and then um, also, in many cases, powdery mildew resistance is not one gene. It's probably a combination of several genes or um, region that contains several genes. So first of all, you need to genetically transfer that by crossing into your germplasm and track the um, back crossing in the genetics through the creation, the, the crossing process, you need good genetic markers associated with the actual trait. And again, you need to be able to make sure that it works well in, in your um, facility and with your pathogens. So if you start, imagine if you have their, the published essay and you generate a marker or they may they, they, they release a marker and you start you need the germplasm you need the donor of the trait and you need to be able to cross that and it's going to be a few months of um, testing before you can even start to understand whether it's it's relevant for your germplasm so it's kind of a big effort to to do on on you know there's a big risk involved and the actual marker may not be indicative of resistance relevant to your germplasm. We do things uh, we do things a bit differently. We map the resistance coming from the client site on site. Um, I don't have a germplasm. I don't have resistance plants. The client has to come up with one plant that's resistant, one plant that's susceptible, and we do the mapping. And then you know that whatever attacks your crop is what we're mapping resistance to that. Uh, so, and I don't have a claim. It's not going to be my marker. It's, it's going to be the client's marker. They could do with it whatever they want, breed with it in-house, license it, sell it, or, or so on. I, but I know for a fact that if the project goes through, in the end, the client will have uh, a resistant crop. Uh, and in many cases, genetic markers or even genes, known genes, 
uh, are not useful. You can see that in the tomato industries, tomato mosaic virus. virus. Um, there's at least six markers for genes that confer resistance to the virus. In many cases, you move from country to country or even regions in the country, and tomato virus five marker doesn't mean anything. You, you your entire crop will go uh, will be susceptible, right? So there is a great value in actually finding and mapping resistance to your pathovirus. Uh, in some cases, there are lucky mechanisms or people who find certain resistance mechanisms that have a broad sense, you know, if it, especially if it's a mechanical resistance, like if the plant has a mechanical trait that, for example, very dense hairs on the, on the leaf and the pathogen for some reason can't uh, adhere to, to the actual leaf, it cannot penetrate, then the plant becomes resist, becomes resistant not by, um, some molecular mechanism but some mechanical mechanism and these things happen and usually if you have that that's kind of a broad uh, resistance mechanism we work with one of our clients that um, they they claim to have super broad resistance in a hemp type um, plant to botrytis powdery mildew uh, and i think also fusarium which is an unrelated disease altogether, but they uh, they claim that this variety doesn't catch anything; it just grows out. Uh, but they grow in a certain type of climate, very dry. What happens when you move that plant to I don't know Kentucky or uh, Louisiana or places where the climate is hot and humid? I don't know if it, it will be resistance. Um, so we we take a different approach. Awesome. Well, let's talk about selfing. Uh, I'm sure a lot of our listeners have plants or use uh, female pollen. That's feminized pollen uh, with plants. As far as breeding to get to from point A to point Z, does selfing make a lot of sense from your perspective? If we are, if we can identify markers, and then you know, I think using two plants with the same gene pairs. That'll get rid of 50% of the alleles that you would get with breeding. But does that come, is there a problem or problems that are associated with that? Um, so first of all, the way we map trait, we don't need that. We don't need inbreeding. We analyze, that's kind of the shortcut we, we made. We just analyze a four-way hybrid. Um, so people tell me sometimes like, wait, I need to wait a few months till I get another cycle going. I'll, I'll inbreed my plant. Then we'll make a, I don't need to wait for the inbreeding. Um, it's a question of how many, um, when you're, when, when you're doing inbreeding, you're fixing some traits. Now, if it's a single gene or single locus or two areas, in the genome that you need to fix by several cycles of selfing, uh, you may end up with the traits fixed and with parental lines that are good for um, stabilization. And in some cases, you have a larger uh, phenotype or larger effect of the phenotype when you have two copies of, of the same allele. If the trait is multi loci or three and up, very difficult to do by selfing and the risk of selfing is you know people have been doing selfing for generations before they knew about genetics you know they, they called it true breeding and true breed but they did selfing they fixed traits or at least some of the traits and they knew that it bred true it had the same traits as the, the parents or one of the parents right um and in practical, in, in, you know, for practical use, in some cases it works. For more complex traits, it's just uh, not easy to do. And cannabis has really strong inbreeding depression. Uh, I've seen cases where plants that are self-3, S3, um, they barely make seeds and they grow super slow. Same, you know, you see, you see, 
a clone of, of the original plant and then S3 of the same plant, multiple S3s, and they are just like maybe three times slower to grow. So if you're a commercial breeder, you, you can't have that. So I mean, you, it's not like you move from 60 to 62 days. You move from 60 to 120. If you had three or two crops in, indoors or whatever, uh, you, you completely change the way the plant behaves now. So some cases you, you got lucky, you self once, you self twice and you fix the trait and you get what you want and yeah and there, the there's, whole, there, there's ways uh you know traditional breeders that aren't using genomic tools use like uh, parallel lines and back crossing for uh, heterosis you know and i think those are easy fixes i think you guys have more of a uh a long-term solution that that's actually you know proven data and i think one of the other problems with selfing is if you have uh, undesirable recessive traits. It's real easy to, uh, you know, have problems with those down down the line. Recessive traits in cannabis are a problem. Be anyway, um, I'm not saying you can't find the markers, but once you found a recessive trait and you need to fix, you're trying to make parents, not for clones. You need to fix. Both, you need to fix at least three copies of, or have an efficient way to screen, or maybe screen the seed the seeds themselves, uh, or the seedlings when you're already germinating them to actually have recessive traits. So, auto flower is your your classic example. Uh, people are are doing this. People are having uh, maybe fifty percent auto flowers. So in some cases, they have fully auto flower seeds. That, so they have done. Something like this. Uh, auto flower is actually uh, it's an interesting case because it's not exactly most auto flowers that I know of are. Uh, there are several alleles out there that people use. They probably all come from northern varieties. There's a myth that they all come from northern skies from Ruderalis cross. I don't buy it, but. Let's go with that. Um, so, um, auto flowers are usually compound um, compound heterozygote. Um, yeah, sorry, compound homozygous plant, meaning you have two copies that make the trait you want, but they're not identical. Um, and, and that would be recessive. You'd still have to make. If you have two copies of that trait in, in your parents, um, so that's, there are ways to work around this. Uh, manipulation uh, of, of conver sex conversion to one of the parents, things like that. Uh, and, and you are able to produce seeds that would have uh, Auto flower trait, 100% auto flower trait. In some cases, uh, well, I'll just say that in general, auto, um, recessive traits are more difficult to handle in all crops. Uh, but there are ways to do this, uh, even in cannabis. The fact that you have male and flower, male and female flowers, makes it more complicated. But also make the fact that you can do sex conversions. Um, kind of give you a tool that doesn't exist in other crops. Uh, so cannabis has been bred clandestinely by people who are expert breeders with practical tools, but, and they got pretty far ahead, you know, they got to where we are now, and this is fantastic, but at some point you, you kind of reach a limitation, um, and you need genetic markers. It makes things easier. You could do your back crosses. You, you could screen progeny. And, and then you could start stabilizing certain parents and certain traits, even if, they're, um, if they are recessive. Uh, you know, the more complex it is, um, the more you need genetic markers. 
I think there's in cannabis, there's quite a few low hanging fruits that still need to be done. Some of them can be done by conventional breeding. Some of them should be done by uh, molecular tools just because it's faster and more efficient. Uh, but I would say first that let's go for the low hanging fruits. Once those are done, you start climbing and, and pyramiding and, and uh, stacking multiple traits. Uh, I, I could name a few examples of these, but uh, you know, some things that are, are also, you know, people get creative on, on polyploidy and on, on other tools that are, uh, I wouldn't say simple, but um, don't require molecular tools. Um, you, you can generate seedless hemp with tetraploids and diploids and, and, you, and you make stable triploids and there's companies that uh, have already achieved this and this is not using molecular tools this is using chemistry and, and you know there's some they may use some molecular tools to actually isolate their the right types of, of tetraploids and, and triploids but I mean, and, and, and this is such such a valuable challenge to make. I mean, once you have a seedless hemp variety that is calling pollination uh, indifferent, then, and, and you, you don't really need to use molecular markers. But at some point, when you start addressing more complicated traits, I don't know, tendency to form hermaphrodites, things like that, uh, whether that's a recessive or dominant or environmentally affected trait probably is both. Um, you, you have to use molecular tools, otherwise you'll never be able to, unless you're you know, extremely super lucky, that happens too. Yeah, I think that was actually going to be my next uh, question was on intersexual traits, hermaphrodism, uh, and how that can be bred out using tools. Uh, is that something you guys have worked on at all? or? Again, um, so um, I can't comment on what our clients are actually doing uh, on that. Um, there would been there'd been a few months ago. There was a nice publication by Punja from Canada uh, on the genetics or of hermaphrodism. It's not one type of hermaphrodism. There, every breeder who uh, you know kind of played with the crossing plants knows that there's hermaphrodism, there's the bananas, and then there's hermaphrodites that grow on the bottom types, of, on the bottom flowers that are completely different and they're formed in different conditions. So some of it is stress-related, nitrogen, heat, both. And some of it is just a genetic tendency. So you see the entire plot doing very well and all of a sudden you have this plant that makes, makes hermaphrodites. So, if the there's a there's a variety called chupacabra that somebody told me about that they nobody grows it anymore people told me it's a very nice variety but nobody grows it because it tends to make hermaphrodites and it will pollinate your entire crop if you're growing other things with that so nobody grows the chupacabra because uh it, you know it's, it's it's a troublemaker so if you take a chupacabra that always makes, uh, it has a genetic tendency to do that. And you cross it with something that never uh, makes hermaphrodites and you could actually make a, a segregating population, then it's just another trait like I showed earlier. I'll do trait mapping, I'll analyze the, the population, I'll, I'll zoom in on the region and we may find uh, a genetic marker or at least some clue onto the mechanism of hermaphrodism of this type. Yeah, Girl Scout Cookies is uh, something that I think a lot of the viewers are familiar with that has a lot of intersexual traits that express uh, from, from stress and just the plant has, has it in, in the lines because everything that's bred with it has a susceptibility. It makes it also easy to reverse if you're making so, Make it what? I, you, so you broke up. Girl Scout Cookies very common variety that's been bred into a lot of stuff uh, that has 
intersexual traits, uh, you know, stress related and stuff that definitely gets passed on within the progeny. Uh, and then a, a good example of something that doesn't have intersexual traits that is super stable would be like blue dream. A lot of the stuff that's, you know, pre 2000 doesn't have a lot of, uh, intersexual trait issues, but things like sour diesel do. So just for the listeners. I, I mean, this is, this is not a low hanging fruit. This would be much higher up the, the tree of challenges. Powder mildew is, is, you know, and, and then you have to also think about what are the alternative solutions to breeding? Uh, we've had a request at some point for a variety that, you know, to breed a non-sticky, uh hemp type that doesn't make terpenes as much or hardly any people's the, the grower was interested in cbd only not he doesn't care much for terpenes and he said that the terpenes are sticky they, they jam my combine and i was like um get 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 an engineer make a better combine not everything has to go through breeding i mean it's it's it has to make sense financially and, and time-wise. And sometimes there's mechanical solution or, you know, technical solutions that, that can solve your problem without breeding. So I wouldn't jump into, a, a, you know, a, a very complex breeding project, even if there is, a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm confident there are germplasm out there, I actually know for a fact, that hardly make terpenes. Right. Uh, do you want to go about getting that germplasm and then starting uh, <laughs> making it something usable that also makes CBD but doesn't make terpenes? It's a big mess. Yeah, I think there, there's definitely a market for, you know, CBD that, that doesn't have it. You know, I mean, I think that that makes sense on, on some level, but, you know, how much money you want to invest, that's a whole nother thing. Um, so I got another question for you. How long does it take to breed a true inbred line? That depends on what your starting point is. Um, Jamaican line that was published um, by Medicinal Genomics, I think they did F5 or F6, and it isn't fully homozygous, but it's large. I mean, it's it's close enough. Um, so that's like five or six generations of inbreeding and there are reports and actually you work with uh, somebody who can make doubled haploids. Um, so that takes one go. Um, once you get the culture going, you duplicate the genome, you get a double haploid. So it's in one go about six, seven months, you, you have an inbred. Whether that inbred is, is, is a good plant, probably not. Most inbreds are not, especially in cannabis. And we, we talk very loosely about tissue culture and regeneration as if it's easy to do. It really isn't. I mean, you could have, um, <laughs> I, I see the comments by, by people, so, so it's kind of uh, distracting me, sorry. Um, so, uh, well, thank you, whoever it was. <laughs> I appreciate the, com the, the compliment. Um, anyway, um, tissue culture is, is an art on its own or science on its own. You have to have expertise. It's not, you know, it's, it's not easy to have your backyard uh, tissue culture uh, workshop. But even if you are successful and you, you calibrate this for one plant and you try to reproduce the same protocol for other, uh, cannabis is not an easy crop to work with. So you, you, you could go to tissue culture and, and we, we're kind of touching on something else that I might want to mention. Um, gene editing and, and genetic modification of, of, of cannabis. So having tissue culture and success and a, and a good protocol on one hand, whether you're going for doubled haploids or just regular tissue culture for, say, virus cleaning, not necessarily means that uh, it will work for other. you got to maybe recalibrate your protocols for uh, other varieties. So it's, it's not trivial. And, 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 you know, if you, if you have a good 
lab that provides this service for you and they're good, stick to them. <laughs> it's, it's a precious uh, uh, skill. And I want to mention gene editing because I hear that uh, gene editing is catching on mostly in, in Colorado, I guess. Yes, and I don't want to talk about labeling yes, no, do I support or not support. I'm actually uh, a supporter of the technology, but some people are extremely passionate about not interfering with uh, um, you know, this kind of technology, but this is not the point. I was going to speak about the technical aspect of, of tissue culture and, and, and gene editing. So we are providing uh, information tools to actually facilitate gene editing and we can pinpoint targets off targets tell you if the edit was successful or not the fact that you're able to do gene editing and, and i mentioned colorado is because people want to have hemp that is behaving like cannabis but doesn't make thc and in theory you would have to manipulate and knock out or change the enzyme that makes thc and keep only the one that makes cbd or modify that enzyme that makes both into a preference for CBD. And you'd have outdoor growing cannabis that makes high quality um, CBD without going hemp ever. That is one of the holy grails of the industry. And you could do that in theory pretty nicely with uh, gene editing, but Imagine if you actually have a gene editing system and if you work at it hard enough, you will probably be able to do so. And then if you have the genetic information, you'll also be able to do the, to find the target and do the edit. And you still need to go through a stage of propagation and taking the edit and doing some sort of t tissue culture and regenerate a plant from it. And that's not trivial. Uh, not easy to do. So I think all this talk about robust gene editing and as soon as you find the gene, you could knock it out or edit it. We're quite far from that. I mean, I'm pretty sure people are doing it and maybe with some success, but it's not quick to become a robust tool uh, that people would be able to, oh, I found the gene, let's enhance it, change it, uh, knock it out. We're we're getting there, but it's going to take a while till this becomes routine practice in cannabis. That's my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that uh, I believe in science, and I think molecular breeding, which is very different than the genomic. I mean, genomics is a part of molecular breeding, but it's definitely not. You guys don't do molecular breeding, but I definitely believe that it's something that we need to work with and you know see the outcomes of what they're doing it they've done it for a lot of things over the last you know 30 years and been successful with it i think there's a lot of people in the industry that are very scared of it and i don't think it's something to be afraid of although it's something that we need to be cautious of using i think they've had problems with it in the past with certain things and that's that's uh, just one of the things that you have to be concerned about so uh how do you think energy will impact traditional cannabis breeding in the future you know, in, in genomics in general. So we already have. Um, I mean, we, we work with a lot of the big uh, companies in Canada and, and also in the U.S. Uh, we we do the genomic analysis for them. They they do the actual breeding. So um, as soon as they, you know, these companies get to new varieties and cultivars, whether it's hemp or uh, cannabis. You know, we, we, we have our thumbprint on, on, on how they got there. Although, you know, as I said, we don't, it's their data, it's their technology, it's their IP. We just help them get there and we got paid for it, uh, obviously. Um, but I think we, the more companies see this and come to us and realize and in some cases we build packages that are more affordable i mean we, we realize that uh, uh not all growers are canopy growth it does require commitment it does require uh you know to have a breeding project breeding breeding program of some scope 
in which you could use the genetic tools because there's no point in me providing you a state-of-the-art genome and genetic markers if you're not going to use uh, uh, marker-assisted selection afterwards with the markers. So you do need to have sort of a cutoff of, of, but we did come up with some tools to help even uh, smaller breeders. Um, we, we made something called CanScan to pretty much genotype and make an inventory just so people know what they have and they can manage their collection, their germplasm and their production um, in a cost-effective way, not super expensive. Um, as a first step, we made this so that people would, you know, do this, see the value. We're not, it's not very profitable business, uh, but we want that to be a gateway towards breeding and the more people do breeding the more business for us and you know we, we see the impact um we are not a cannabis company and we we work on other crops so we don't have a, you know an actual uh plan to develop our own stuff right and so that's kind of um you know so having a real impact on an industry with coming up with the killer cultivar that's not happening from from us directly will maybe come from one of our clients um but technology wise i think we've raised the bar um and and i think a lot of the people who are doing large-scale breeding today especially with hemp are going to have to use some sort of of genetic tools if they don't want to be left behind uh, you know, I, I really respect conventional breeding, selecting, phenotyping, a good eye and, and a good, uh, you know, you go in the field and you see within a hundred of hundred or thousands of plants, that plant that is a mutant and it's interesting and you go and pick it up that, that kind of breeders, um, are precious and, and I'm not, we don't intend to replace that. That's going to stay uh but once you found something and you want to use it as you know donor of a trait or make it as a backbone and introduce stuff it's just genetics are here to you know, genomic tools are here to stay and make things more efficient and faster so i see a lot more people moving into our you know using our services or, or other companies or other tools in, in this field and and doing the same type of of breeding Excellent. Well, I think there's probably a ton of questions, Peter. Some of the questions. Good God. I was, uh, Let me just get some more water for a second. Yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, so let, let me... Uh, <laughs> So now ask your questions. People have been asking questions the whole time and I've been like, please remember your questions. Uh, okay, here's one from Trent. So how do other crops stabilize polyploidalism oh. and can it be done for cannabis? Good question. I kind of addressed that. Um, this anthroculture, anthroculture, which you have, um, that's, that's mostly done actually not for polyploidism. That's done mostly for uh, reach, reaching homozygosity first, but you could also use that for polyploidy. Uh, people use colcitine. Col I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right in English. It's a chemical that um, interferes with the cell cycle uh, at least once. The plant doesn't become, you know, toxic or anything but the one cycle that you do it, you do it on it causes uh, an, an aberrant, aberrant cycle of duplication so sometimes the cells get some of the cells get stuck in a phase of and, and you may have genome duplication um, there are other ways to to do this as well um, I, I don't have time to go into the really cool methods of of uh, of doing this, but uh, that's kind of one way to achieve genome duplication. Uh, stability is, is 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 another issue. That's mostly done by trial and error. I mean, if you make a polyploid 
tetraploid and you cross it with diploid uh, and, and, and get triploids, some of them will not be stable. So if you have a stable triploid, first of all, you, you can maintain it as a clone. And other crops do, that, do it like that. They have triploids that are stable, sorry, uh, diploids that are regular stable and tetraploids that are stable. And they cross and then like seedless watermelon are, are made that way. And the progeny are triploid. They cannot make seeds or viable seeds. They're seedless by definition. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, routine production. And they've achieved that mostly by trial and error. I'm sure that in the early days of, of doing this, some of the lines would segregate and, and become revert back to being diploids and, and um, create seeds. Or they, they take in pollen and create seeds. Uh, interesting line that people are taking that's done mostly in Canada, I guess. Um, it's called polyembryony. Uh, you, you have sometimes in some varieties, in some cases of, of the seeds, there's a zygote, a, a sexual embryo. And then around it, there are embryos that are actually clones of the female. Um, of the mother, so you you pretty much have that as an interesting tool to work with, and if you could manipulate that and employ chemical duplication on that as well, you you could also reach stable um, different levels of ploidy. I have seen work by a scientist who had uh, collected or taken cannabis plants to Chernobyl. I kid you not. They have. Uh, he's collected cannabis plants that grew in Chernobyl. He looks at mutations that are. So there's bizarre and exotic ways to to um, achieve um, chromo chromosomal aberrations. Um, once the mutation is stable, you, you can work with it, and it's safe, and it's perfectly good. What else we got, okay, Peter? I had one. Oh, we got a lot. So hold on. Uh, good God. Okay. So here's. Uh, can you talk about cannabis being adaptogenic? I'm not sure. I'm familiar with that uh, term. What you know, you don't have the person. I, I'm. I'm not sure. I know what adaptogenic is. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No worries. Let's move on. Uh, we had, uh, sorry, I just blew by all the, give me one second. I'm going to Google it. Short Brooks, I'll just talk first. My good friend, Short Brooks, Gene Finder, he did a project with the polyploidy uh, getting triploids. And he said that the, the outcome was abandoned because the the plant material did not have a good terpene profile it was undesirable so yeah i'd be really interested in people that are creating stuff if it i'm sure it can be done it's going to take time but uh you know and this was done uh, like 10 years ago so if anyone would like to come on the show to talk about it that'd be great yeah, i think uh yeah um i the i follow um shen from from oregon cbd he keeps uh posting on, on LinkedIn. I mean, super public. Um, he, he shows pretty cool pictures of, of triploids and they're really nice plants performing way better than the uh, diploid. So I think they're, they're achieving great progress there. Wow. Yeah, we got to get him on here. <laughs> okay, so can you in, so can you read this one? Uh, can you influence traits with enzymes through the food or does it have to be the natural enzymes in the plant? Traits of the plants, I, I would assume, uh, through the food. Um, I'm kind of convoluted way of, of asking. I'm not sure I understand uh, okay, well, what the asker is asking. Uh, We'll have them clarify in the chat, but we'll go on to the <laughs> yeah, next Yeah, I'm, I'm not um, sure I'm, I'm on the question here. Yeah, I mean, nutrition can influence terpenes and cannabinoids. If he's talking about terpenes, then 
yes, but as far as traits, that could be a whole different conversation because there's traits that can be, you know, I think we're talking about phenotypes that can be manipulated by nutrition environment and in environment. So future if, if they're talking about the plant then and, and the food relates to the plant and not the people, um, and, and they mean the nourishment of the plant or, or the, the fertigation, then yeah, sure. I mean, uh, any plant, not just cannabis, responds to, I mean, you, you, you for example, you, you irrigate with high salinity water, you may get more sugar in the tomato. So you get more, you provide more nitrogen, you get more, I don't know, terpenes, cannabinoids. So the plant responds well. Chrom chromosomal crossover. Uh, again, I'm not sure what this refers to. If it's recombination and frequency of recombination in cannabis, uh, that if if that's the meaning of the question, then um, there it, it's not symmetrical. There are regions like same as other plants, but there are regions that have uh, very, very short recombination blocks, like two megabase pairs. Um, so there's regions where you have genetic markers would be not very effective if they're not in high resolution because, uh, you know, chromosome crossovers and, and, and recombination. And then there are regions where uh, they're, they're called recombination deserts where you hardly have uh, uh, recombination events and uh, it happens less frequent. And in many cases, interesting regions like cassettes of terpene synthase or cassettes of what we call them cassettes, but clusters of um, R genes or um, cannabinoid synthesis chunks of the genome tend to have a high recombination rate as far as we've seen so far we didn't look at that many not yet at least i mean we have some information on this and we we did look at uh, uh some recombination events we're actually analyzing several populations with recombination rate right now i don't have a lot of data to kind of give a rule about it yet but uh Definitely, there are regions that tend to cross over more than others. Okay, so someone asked just for clarification uh, what you meant by molecular tools. Mm. When did I say that? <laughs> uh, I, I, CRISPR Cas9. Oh, okay, these. Um, you use maybe. Okay, so we are a data company. We are generating molecular markers, meaning sequences of DNA that you can track by PCR-like assays or outside of the plant. We're not putting anything into the plant. We're providing information to track certain traits. And that's molecular tools in my book as well. You know, molecular tools is, is the ability to track markers, genetic markers. Um, you're correct that molecular tools may refer to other things, also gene editing and CRISPR-Cas or uh, recombinant DNA technology. People may use that. We are harvesting data, so we don't really, um, we're harvesting or generating and, and providing clients with insights and, and data to use. How they use it depends on, you know, the company, some people, would like to do gene editing, so they use our data to get high resolution gene, genome information. Some people want to do classic breeding, they need genetic markers to cross and then select each progeny that has the right type of combination of, of genes that they want. Um, we don't interfere with how the clients do their breeding. If they're using super advanced technology or using classical breeding, uh, using marker assisted breeding, whatever. So I think this may have been the clarification from the earlier question. 
Oh, okay. That's that's a good question as well. Um, if, if now that I understand it, um, in general, um, there's several ways to affect the terpene profile of a plant because it's not generated by one enzyme; it's generated by dozens of enzymes, and they're all not necessarily specific. Uh, they're some of them are what, what's called promiscuous. They tend to make several project pr products at several conditions. For example, if you have high light or high temperature, they'll make beta caryophyllin. In other cases, it's cold. They'll make. Um, they prefer to make same enzyme. Would prefer to make something else. Um, so you can manipulate the terpene profile just by agricultural practices and for fertilization, for example. Uh, and then to answer the second half of the question, can um, you make terpenes that are not, you know, the enzyme is not in the DNA? That's the answer would probably be not. Um, if there's an enzyme that makes some sort of a terpene that makes the smell of cherries or blueberries, uh, not that I know which one it is, but assuming there is one, um, I think there's actually one for, for blueberry. Um, if you don't have the right enzyme in the germplasm that you're breeding with, you, you just don't have the machinery. So that would be kind of a, actually an easier task to breed. Uh, a yes, no question, right? You could have introduced the enzyme that makes the smell of blueberries. How much of it is a different question, like whether it makes a lot of that blueberry smell or little, that would be a more difficult question to address. But yes, no, uh, fairly easy to do by breeding. Uh, do con okay i'll read a question so uh you touched on trp9 synthase producing terpenes but not on cannabinoid synthesis do conditions and metabolites create a competitive nature in terpene and cannabinoid synthesis ah wow um i would say yes i have a slide i don't want to go back into slides but i have a slide that shows the overlap or tangent between uh there are precursors that lead to the same pathway and the organ at which it's you know the trichomes and the different types of cells that, that produce the trichomes are the sweatshop of the plant they're making huge amounts per volume of specific compounds so they're maybe limited and regulated on how much is in there and by the flux of the carbon backbone going into pathway one or two terpenes or cannabinoids, they share a common um, backbone kind of way before. Um, so there may be, uh, yeah, it gets more complex in the biochemistry there, but they, there could be a case where there's a limiting factor in the carbon flux heading to um, the, the plant and their enzyme that makes the terpenes or kind of directs the carbon towards the terpenes is a more successful or more productive enzyme. More would go towards terpenes, less would go towards cannabinoids. That could happen in theory. I guess each variety may have, each cultivar may have its own, you know, uh, but the, the answer is yes. We got any more questions, Peter? Okay. Um, Jack is asking when growing from seed, uh, how many varieties of males can one expect? <laughs> uh, so if you don't have true males in the population, one can expect zero males. Um, in cannabis, you, you could actually have something called X males or converted males or pollen donor or whatever you want to call them. Only females in the system. 
and you forced your your female to make pollen and you crossed with it uh, feminized seed and um, you would not have males in this in the system zero um, if you did have male pollen the x the y chromosome there came from a male and maybe um, you'd have distribution ranging from 50 percent to lower frequencies of males they would be uh, I have to think about this for a second. You may have several types of males. I don't know if you would actually be able to tell the difference, but genetically you could. If there had been recombination in the male pollen, uh, then each one would be unique, right? They're not inbred, they're heterozygous, and if you haven't used an inbred male, then you'd have new combinations of male pollen interacting with female cells and creating new embryos. So you'd have, I can't tell you in what frequency, but you have multiple types, if any. So a while ago, uh, Flora Nugs asked, can you identify... Uh, Hermy traits at the RNA slash DNA level. Yeah, I addressed that uh, a while ago. That um, first of all, there'd been a publication about that pretty recently. Um, I don't know how you know uh, wide of of a conclusion you could draw from 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 that, as there are several types of hermaphrodism. Uh, but we we that publication shed a lot of light on the mechanisms of sex determination in cannabis. So in theory, if you mapped it and it's a it's a mappable trait and it's genetic and not entirely environmental, or at least the predisposition is genetic, you can map it and within a certain germplasm, you 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 would be able to generate a marker of which plants would actually tend to hermaphrodite. But we don't have a ready-made marker for you, know. We will need to map it and, and identify it. Well, in, in conventional breeding, like like what I do typically, you know, I've stuff go from you know one percent. I think ten percent twenty years ago, if you had ten percent females, that was considered good, or ten percent males in your feminized seed, that was considered good. And then slowly, got breeding, you know, got better and better, especially over in Europe, and it, it got to that one percent. And now we're looking at, you know, some of the, the varieties that I'm breeding and I'm working with with some of my friends. We're looking at that 0 0.02, which is like one in 5,000. And that's just using, you know, the conventional, traditional methods of breeding. So I, I think that you're still going to have it no matter what, that, that 0 0.02, one in 5,000 is still considered an acceptable number. But uh, maybe someday we'll have zero. I mean, it's anything's possible. We have um, generated a genotyping set that um, for a particular gen genotype or germplasm that you work with, you could screen through, call out um, the males and would have zero, uh, absolute zero. Just you would get rid of all the plants that have a Y chromosome. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have genetic markers that could identify a Y and an X, get rid of all the Ys, zero. Uh, it's it's work. I mean, you have to screen a lot of plants, but once you got rid of the Y, it's not in the population. It's just not not there. I'm not exactly sure. Also, that's a recommended practice on on breeding sides. There's some advantages to using males, but this is an entirely different conversation. Right. Uh, well, uh, minor cannabinoids to become the major cannabinoids. Oh, okay. Short answer. Yes, not easy. <laughs> and sorry, James, for cutting your face off. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I think that's all the time we have for today. I really appreciate you coming on the show, Ori. Sure. Enjoyed it. Um, yeah, it's – it's um, usually I, I, I it go to more, you know, a lot of, of, of the – conferences I, I talk at are very scientific a lot of people were not actually touching the plant they're, they're in the lab so it's always you know kind of nice to speak to people who are actually 
field or growing the plant um, or using the plant. <laughs> Always fun. Um, so I enjoyed it. Thank you so much for um, inviting me over. Yeah, I, I, I think people loved it. They were... Uh... I, I posted a comment a long time ago, someone saying I'll probably need to watch this three or four times to soak it all yeah. up. So everyone appreciates your time. Yeah, thank you. And they can reach out to Energy and send us uh, on our website. There's uh, webinars and, and explanations of what we do, how we do. Reach out, send yeah. questions, uh, just, just, and they'll quickly, forward to me. Uh, what, what's the website? E. NR Gene, uh, N -R -G -E -N -E. dot com. I, yep. Like that. Yep. Excellent. All right. You got it. And the man uh, emceeing the conversation is this guy. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank, uh, th thanks, everyone, for watching. Next week, we have uh, Rick from Mosca Seeds. And we may have Eric from Dungeon Vault coming on the show to discuss uh, regular breeding and seeds in the United States. So I hope you guys tune in. Thanks yeah. again. And, 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 and James, what, what was uh, the, the audience feedback if they knew anyone who was an expert in what topic? Oh, man, I've already forgot. Yeah, but, no, I uh, did too. But Poly so uh, I think Oregon CBD would be a great, great group to have on the show. I mean, that's I want to do a hemp one coming up in the future. So if anyone wants to recommend some hemp companies, they'd like to be featured on the show. That'd be great. Um, I think hemp is kind of a big topic now. You know, I think people it's, it's changed and evolved so much. So yeah, I really look forward to it. Yeah. And everybody wants the, the loud hats. Yeah. We're going to make new loud hats. We got All some right. we got other ones coming down the pipe. All right. So, so everybody, everybody hold tight. James I'm in for one. I, I earned it. Yeah. Yep. All right. All right. Thank Th you. Thanks, Sorry. Thanks, James, and everybody. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Pacific time with Olfactory uh, Genetics uh, talking about their their seed line. So. Right. Thanks, everybody. With that, I will kill the live stream. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.